So good afternoon. Um, my name is Dr. Richardson, and this is lecture seven of the course using vector calculus. to solve problems in electricity and magnetism. Again, I'm Dr. Richardson. I can be reached by email. My email address is srichards22 at comcast.net. And this online course is supported by this NSF Center for Integrated Quantum Materials as the uh, acronym of CEQM. and generously supported through a grant from the National Science Foundation. That grant number is DMR, Division of Materials Research, 1231319. So again, as a reminder, uh, as we said before, this is lecture seven. Learning is not a passive activity. Please take notes throughout the online course lectures. You should certainly ask questions. There'll be time after the lecture during our recitation section for folks to ask questions, as well as you can ask questions by email, by sending me an email message at srichards22 at comcast.net. And I promise to respond within 24 hours. Even questions can be regarding, with, they can be concerning homework problems, problem set problems, or questions in lecture. Again, there are weekly problem sets. So problem set five, the solutions were posted last week on the Google Drive. Um, problem set six it was posted last Tuesday. Problem set six was also posted last Tuesday. Uh, problem set six, the solution key will be available next Tuesday, and problem set seven will be posted next uh, Tuesday. It's extremely important not just to simply read the solutions to the problem, but actually go through it and work it individually not asking Google for help or any other textbooks for, for, uh, for assistance. And even when you get the solution, don't read the solution. Just take a piece of paper and just go through the solution line by line because that process will give you a hint as to um, how to, to address something that you're missing in, in solving a problem. So you learn nothing from the course if you don't do the problem sets and just sitting back and reading the problem set solutions, you learn nothing either. And finally, you'll definitely need a ruler. Okay, so let's start. So today we're going to look at the problem of using symmetry. 
to solve or find the electric field. And a problem. And the best way to do that turns out to be a nice little recipe due to our friend Carl Frederick Gauss. And we'll refer to this as Gauss's Law. So some time ago, we talked about the idea of a flux and we introduced it in a mathematical context. Today, I want to spend some time talking about what flux is physically. So for physical example, let's go to a model we've talked about before, that of water flow. So you can imagine looking at a stream of water particles moving from left to right, and they all move with a certain velocity. So there's something we can define, the vector j, and it will be defined as a current density. So it's a vector field, so that means that each point in the water, there's a vector associated with it called the current density j. It has magnitude and direction. So physically, what does the current density mean? It's the number of particles of water in this case that pass a unit area per unit time. Okay. So for example, Dr. Richardson, we, we for a second. I'm sorry. What's the problem, Tina? Uh, we, I couldn't hear you for a second. Uh, my uh, mute is off, so it looks like it looks like I've been transmitting. Are you saying I haven't been transmitting? I think it went out for a second, but so if okay. you could start the definition of current density. Okay, so let's start all over because there are some technical issues. So we're using uh, the idea of symmetry to find the electric field. And the way to do this is to employ something called Gauss's law. So we talked about the concept of flux a few lectures ago, a few problem sets ago, and we just defined it as a physical creature, as a mathematical creature. We didn't talk about it physically. So today we wanna to ask the question, what does flux mean physically? So let's go back to the example we used in vector calculus when we talked about the divergence and the curl vector operators, water flow. So if you look at a stream of water, in this case in two dimensions, at each point in the water, you have a vector or you have a water molecule and it's moving with a certain speed and direction. If you use the idea of a vector field, then what that means is that at every point in the velocity field, there's a vector that you can assign to a water molecule. That vector is something which we'll call the current density. And it is a creature that has magnitude and direction. And it has a very nice, simple physical meaning. It's the number of particles that pass a unit area per unit time. So the problem we wanna ask here is that if I have my water flow, and let's say I construct a square loop that has an area A, and I'll capitalize A for the moment. key question I want to ask is, what is the flux of the current density? Passing through 
this unit area, this square loop that has area A. So that's a question. So I've got to do two things to get a handle how to answer this question. One I've already done. I've defined a current density. It's number of particles per area per second. The next thing I have to do is focus a little bit more carefully on area. And what I mean by that. So I said this before, and I want to come back and repeat it in more detail here. We sometimes are used to thinking about area as a number. But in vector calculus, that's not true. Area is actually a vector. So let's see how that works out. So again, let us go back to the problem we looked at before we had a square loop of area A. And we will divide this square loop of area A into little small patches, DF, DS. These are our friends. We've seen these before. These are just differential surface elements. So I claim that area is, so let's blow this up. Let's take this picture and blow it up. And so this is DS. So I made the claim, sounds audacious, but let's see, that area is a vector. So dif the differential surface element is a area also. I claim that it's a vector. So that means it has to have magnitude that's clear there. That's just so many square meters. But it also has to have a direction. So if you think about that, that's intuitively clear. This particular differential surface element is different than this particular differential surface element, which is different than this particular di differential surface element. And the area encompassed, or area within DS, those are going to be all the same in all three cases. So it's not the area that changes, but the normal vector to the surface is different. So you can change the orientation of the vector or the orientation of the surface in space. So if this expression is true, I need to complete it by introducing something we've seen before, our unit normal vector. So this tells me exactly, using the tools of vector analysis, what I mean when I say an area is a vector. It has a magnitude, ds, but it also has a direction. And n hat is a vector that's normal to the surface, ds. Now, if you think about it for a minute, that's not the only problem. There's some ambiguity. Here's a differential surface element ds, and here is a unit normal vector that's orthogonal to the surface, and that's fine. But couldn't you have a unit normal vector that points in this direction? So let's say k hat is up. And in this case, the unit normal vector and hat points down. In this case, it points up. So I have to figure out a way to resolve this ambiguity. And I'm going to go back to something we've seen many, many times in this course. I'm going to go back to the right-hand rule. So 
my right hand rule is going to allow me to determine the direction of the unit normal vector. Again, n hat is the unit normal vector. And I will look at, so this is my differential surface element. And if you look at the boundary and you look at the way these directions are defined in the bound along the boundary surface, that follows the right hand rule. So we will just use that convention to define n hat accordingly, which again is normal to any line that's part of the plane containing ds. So similarly, if you had a surface ds and you defined the direction along the boundary of the surface to be in those directions as indicated, then the unit normal vector using the right hand rule would point in that direction. Okay. So now we're good to go. And let's go back to the original problem. We want to calculate the flux of the current density through some surface A. And what we have to do is perform a surface integral. Namely, we need to break the area A We need to break A up into small pieces. It's always the trick you use when you do integration. And these small, small pieces are differential surface elements, ds. So again, j is my current density. She is a vector. ds is my differential surface element and we now know exactly what we mean when we say that this that he is a vector it has magnitude and direction so let's use the example again here's a i can break it up into small differential surface elements ds I have a current density J that goes in that direction. And note, I'm going to orientate the surface, my, my uh, square loop A, such that it has a unit normal vector and hat that is in the same direction as the current density. So what do I get when I make that assumption? Well, vector analysis tells us something very simple, that this complicated expression of the integrand, where you take the dot product of two vectors, now simply reduces to the product of two scalars, because the angle between j and ds is zero, cosine of zero is one. And again, this is a surface integral. The next thing you have to realize, or you can assume in this case, is that the current density, the number of particles that pass a unit area per, per unit time, that's gonna be a constant. If it's a constant everywhere in the velocity field of the fluid, it's certainly a constant at the surface. So what that means mathematically is that you can pull it out of the integral. And then finally, you're left with the integral to do. And that says you take ds's, you take these small differential surface elements, you add them up over the entire surface, and you just get the area of that square, uh, the area encompassed by that square loop. So this is very nice. And this allows you 
to see something interesting that makes common sense. The current density has units of particles per area per second. The area has units of meters squared. So when everything is said and done, I'll get rid of this to give myself some space. This thing is going to give you a current. It has units of particles particles per second. Now you see why we call J current density because it's related to a current. So this tells you exactly how to calculate how many water molecules pass through this area. Current tells you how many particles pass through third unit time. Current density tells you how many particles pass through the unit time per area. Okay, so we've gone to some great trouble to introduce this definition of flux. It's a surface integral. So again, let's write this again. The flux of J through A is the surface integral. And again, A, my surface can always be divided into very, very small infinitesimal regions of, of area differential surface elements ds. I need to do that because after all, J is a vector field and it differs a lot according to where you are in space. So you have to evaluate J at every ds and add this up over the entire surface and get an answer. So you may ask, well, why do we need this complicated surface integral? It's a good question. And the answer follows here accordingly. Suppose I have my current density J points from left to right. And suppose I consider three different cases or orientations of A. In this case, A has a unit normal vector that's in the same direction of J as J, the current density. In this case, the unit normal vector is perpendicular to the direction of the current density. And in this case, it's neither. But I could recognize that there's an angle theta between n hat and j with current density j. So let's just think about this physically before we do any mathematics. Do we expect flux of j through a? So these are all a. Do we expect flux? through case one, and the answer is yes, for the follow from the example we just did before. Case two, no, because look at the orientation of this area. Its unit vector is normal to J, but just look at this physically. There are not gonna be any water molecules going through A. So there is no flux of J through the surface when it's orientated in this direction. And case three, where the uh, area is tilted at an angle theta with respect to the direction of the current density, there is also going to be a flux, but it's not going to be as large as case one. 
So you can put all this together, encompass all three ideas, by just recognizing that when you take the dot product of the current density with the differential surface element, you'll get an angle, you'll get two scalars, J and DS respectively, times the cosine of theta, which again is dimensionless. So flux is a physical thing, it tells you how many particles pass through a unit area for unit time. In this case, water molecules, you can imagine a piece of uh, a radioactive material where radioactive particles are being emitted. And you can imagine constructing a unit area somewhere in space and asking how many particles pass through that mathematical surface per unit time. And well, that's a key point to make out. Um, this screen, this area, it can be some type of detector So it's either mathematical or physical device. But it could just be an imaginary mathematical construct. It's just some type of surface that pop objects go through, in this case, particles. OK. OK, so now that we have a physical idea of what we mean by the flux of a vector field, we can ask the question, what is the flux of the electric field? through some surface. So we have a completely different physical problem. And I'm going to take the simplest example that I can come up with, point charge. So that we know, so we know the point charge creates an electric field. That electric field is a vector field. It's radial. It goes like one over r squared. And it has a magnitude q. So in fact, and this is a little tricky, but think about this for a second. I really should be drawing this in three dimensions, right? But I'm working on my two dimensional whiteboard, three dimensions I could put in using perspective, but I'm not going to do that here. And you could always plot this using Wolfram Alpha. Learn how to plot vector fields in three dimensions, something you can do in Wolfram Alpha. So what's happening here are is that at each point surrounding the charge, there are points in space, and at each point there's an electric field vector. Now, these electric field vectors, just be careful. It's not like the previous case where you actually had physical water molecules moving in a stream. You don't. You don't have physical particles being ejected from this point charge, but you have something being generated from this point charge as an electric field. So I could do the same, or I could ask the same problem. Suppose I construct around my point charge a sphere of radius r. And this sphere will have a surface S. So by analogy, I could calculate the flux of the electric field through this surface. 
again, what I have to do is take the surface and break it up into small little differential surface elements. Note that each one of those differential surface elements has a unit normal vector. Note that the electric field at the surface of the sphere is going to be pointed in a direction that's radial from the center where the charge is. That's what the definition of the electric field tells you. So this, and again, I'm integrating this over a surface. So this is an expression for the flux of the electric field through a surface almost. There's something that's missing. The thing that's missing is my surface is closed. It's not open as in the previous case. I just had a patch. Here I have a complete surface, which is closed. So the way to tell people on the street that I'm doing that is to put a circle through the integral. So the question is, what is this thing? How could you calculate the flux of the electric field through a closed surface, which is in this case, the closed surface is a sphere of radius r. Well, you know, I use the same machinery as before. So since I've defined a closed surface, I can get rid of that. One thing at a time, the electric field at the surface is going to be radial. And it's going to be in the same direction as the normal unit normal vector of a differential surface element at the surface of the sphere. So symmetry tells you that those two vectors, E and DS, are going to be parallel to each other. That means the angle between them is zero. That means that the cosine of zero is one. That means that this complicated surface integral, which involved vectors, it's going to start to look a little simpler because I can replace E dot DS with just the product of two scalars. Anytime you can get rid of vectors and just write scalars, that's a wonderful thing to do. The next thing I want to re recognize is that by symmetry, the electric field is constant over S. Not only is that true by symmetry, it's true by just looking at the definition. The electric field goes like one over R squared. It, the sphere has a constant radius R. So this electric, the charge is not gonna change. So, I mean, the direction of the electric field changes, right? That's what the unit normal, that's what the unit radial vector tells you, tells you the direction of the electric field. But the magnitude of this guy is not gonna change. So that has important consequences because that just means you can pull it out of the integral. And now the remaining thing you have to do is evaluate the surface integral of ds over this closed surface, which in this case is a sphere. So that actually is pretty easy to do. And we'll do it here. So the flux of the electric field through a closed surface, which is in this case is a sphere, is just going to be replaced by EDS in the integrand, since the electric field and the differential surface element are in the same direction. The electric field is constant over the surface, so it comes out of the integral. And all you have to do is the surface integral which is just r squared sine theta d theta d phi using spherical polar coordinates, which we are familiar with. Remember, of course, that the radius of this sphere, r, is a constant. So it comes outside of the integral. And it's very easy to do this double integral over the polar angle 
and the theta and the azimuthal angle phi. The azimuthal angle goes from zero to pi. Sorry, the polar angle goes from zero to pi, and the azimuthal angle goes from zero to two pi. So what we have found is that the flux of the electric field over this closed surface where the surface is a sphere is just going to be E r squared four pi. That's what you get when you evaluate this double integral. And finally, we're home. The electric field of a point charge is just Q divided by four pi epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space, times r squared. So that's what E is. And then I have an r squared four pi in the numerator. And so this reduces to Q divided by epsilon naught. So I have a way of relating the electric field generated by this point charge in terms of a surface integral. So what I calculated is in fact an expression that has a name called Gauss's law. And Gauss's law simply says that the flux of an electric field through a closed surface, S, surface has to be closed, equals Q divided by epsilon naught. And this Q is going to be very special, so I'm going to give it the subscript of En, where this is the charge enclosed by the surface S. This surface has a very special name. It's not just any surface. It's something we'll call a Gaussian surface, which in this case is just a sphere, a radius r. So this is Gauss's law. So why should you care about Gauss's law? What is it useful for? Well, a couple of comments. We have derived this, we have derived Gauss's law for the example of a point charge. Turns out it's not just true for a point charge, it's true for any charge distribution that's enclosed by the Gaussian surface. Next thing we have done is that we have picked a sphere or a surface. We've picked a sphere uh, Let me be a little bit more careful with my language here. We've, we've picked a spherical surface. Of radius R for S. And it turns out that while Gauss's law is certainly true in this derivation, it follows for any so it's a closed spherical surface. We, this is going to be, Gauss's law is going to be true not just for a spherical surface, a radius, R. Probably redundant to say it's a closed spherical surface. All spherical surfaces are closed. It's also true if the surface is some arbitrary creature doesn't have to be just a spherical surface. It can be something that looks like that. And I'm going to leave a proof of that to problem set seven. And the third and final point I want to make about Gauss's law is that Gauss's law is always true. but not always helpful.
Because it turns out that if you want to actually apply Gauss's law to any real problem, let's step back for a minute and, and ask ourselves, why are we using Gauss's law? We're using Gauss's law because it's going to be a way to find the electric field of a system, of a system of discrete point charges or a system of continuous charge distribution. In order to do that, we're going to have to do this surface integral. And in principle, you can do the surface integral, but it's going to be horrendously complicated to do unless you have a great deal of symmetry in the problem. So let's go through a number of examples to see how this works. So the first example we're going to pick will be a problem that we've already discussed. We know how to calculate the electric field for this case. But we're going to derive it by using Gauss's law. So imagine an infinite wire that has a linear charge density of lambda. And what I want to do as in any problem in electrostatics is find the electric field. So what am I talking about? So here's my wire. And again, this wire has some structure to it and I may ignore that. I'm just gonna say it has zero thickness. I could go back and put thickness in it, but that's a different problem. And this system has a linear charge density of so many coulombs per length per meter lambda. So I want to apply Gauss's law to find the electric field. So there are two parts of the problem. First thing I have to do is calculate the left hand side of Gauss's law. That is the flux of the electric field through some Gaussian surface S. So to make this problem doable, I'm going to pick a Gaussian surface that has a tremendous amount of symmetry. I'm going to pick a Gaussian surface and this is an imaginary cut construct. And the surface will be a cylinder. The surface will have a radius, or the cylinder will have a radius R, and it'll have a finite length L. So a couple of things about this Gaussian surface, and it's certainly closed. So the surface has, this Gaussian surface, which is closed, this cylinder has three parts. It has a bottom, it has a top indicated by S sub one and S sub two respectively, and it has a side, S sub three. So the entire sur closed surface has three parts to it, S sub one, S sub two, and S sub three. So while I'm at it, you know, let me make some observations that are easy. S sub one equals S sub two. And by construction, that's just pi r squared. S sub three can be obtained by just taking some scissors, cutting along the edge of the cylinder, spreading the thing out, and realizing that you have a creature that has area which is simply the circumference two pi r times l. So I took the time to actually take the figure and get some information from it. And I'll write that information there. Okay, so back to the problem at hand. The problem at hand is how do I find the electric field of this? linear, infinite line of linear charge density lambda. And 
I did this before, actually evaluating the integral. Okay, go back and look at your notes. Go back and look at uh, appropriate problem sets. Actually, we did this in lecture. But now we're going to solve this problem using Gauss's law. So a couple of things. By symmetry, the electric field has to be pointing in the same direction as the differential surface element. Namely, if you were to rotate the wire, you wouldn't be able to tell that you've rotated it. So the only way the electric field could still be alive after that rotation, as it were, is if it pointed out radially from the wire. So the electric field is radial, as well as the differential surface element. Now you see why I said that Gauss's law really can only be used. It's always true, but it's only helpful to have problems of certain symmetry. Well, if this is the case, then the flux of the electric field through the Gaussian surface is just the product of E and dS, because the angle between the vector E and dS is just zero, cosine zero is one. Same thing as we did before. The next thing is that the electric field by symmetry is just going to be constant anywhere along the surface. Now, let's back up for a minute. And be a little bit more careful. We got ahead of ourselves a bit. So when I said we got our got ahead of ourselves a bit, let's just back up here. This problem really has three parts to it. The closed surface of my Gaussian cylinder, if you will, has three parts. There's an S1, there's an S2, and there's S3. Well, you see now how I got, I let myself get down the road a little bit too far. Let's back up. Okay. So those are the three creatures you want to evaluate. There is a surface integral S1. Note this is no longer closed anymore. It's just the integral over S1. This surface integral is no longer closed. It's just the surface integral over S2, and this integral is no, no longer closed. So we have to do these three surface integrals separately. Okay, so now we're, we can get back in the game. Well, when in doubt, always go back to the original figure. After all, as far as S sub one is concerned, there is a unit normal vector n hat one that points in that direction. It's orthogonal to S one. S two is a surface and it has a, a unit normal vector that points in that direction and hat two. Uh, note that n hat one is in the opposite direction, n hat two. And finally, there's a unit normal vector n hat three, and that just points in a direction that's radially outward. So I have three surface integrals to evaluate. Now again, by symmetry, I don't know what the magnitude of the electric field is, but I know what its direction. It has to be radially outward from the wire. So that tells us that as far as S1 is concerned, n hat one is orthogonal to the electric field. 
that means the angle between them is 90 degrees, the cosine of 90 degrees is zero, so there's gonna be no contribution once you try to evaluate the integrand for s sub one. Same thing for s sub two. n hat two is orthogonal to the electric field. The electric field points radially outward from the wire. And the only hope of finding something that doesn't vanish is by calculating s sub three. But look at the surface integral s sub three n hat three is parallel to the electric field. Both the unit normal vector from the surface of the cylinder and the electric field point in the same direction. So for this problem of an infinite wire that's charged with linear charge density lambda, Gauss's law tells you there's only one contribution. And that's from surface three. How do you calculate that? Now we're in business, same trick. The electric field is constant by symmetry over the surface, which we call S sub three of the Gaussian cylinder. So this comes out of the integ integral. And now how all I have to do is evaluate S sub three. I did that before. G is just two pi R L. So that's the left-hand side of Gauss's law. The right-hand side of Gauss's law says that this must be equal to the charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught then charge enclosed by my Gaussian surface, which in this case is a cylinder, is just the linear charge density lambda times the length of the Gaussian cylinder. So Gauss's law tells me exactly how to find the electric field. The magnitude is just lambda over two pi r epsilon naught Note that the L's disappear. So the electric field is independent of the length of the cylinder or the length of the wire. Because after all, this wire is infinite. So if it's infinite, the problem shouldn't depend upon how long the wire is. And as I said before, the electric field points out radially from the wire. So when I turn that into a vector, I must get that. Note that as R gets bigger and bigger, the electric field vanishes. And we have done this problem before. We did this by actually formally doing an integral. If you go back and look at that appropriate lecture, you see we did much more work, much, much more work. Got the same answer, but we got did much more work. So Gaussian, Gauss's law allows you to solve problems of a, with the possessed symmetry without doing a whole lot of calculus. Final point, the linear charge density goes like a coulombs per meter and R in the denominator goes like a meter. So as true to form, this electric field does have the right units. It goes like one over char the distance squared. Okay. So let's go on and look at a slightly more complicated problem. And that's the case of an infinite plane of charge. And I wanna calculate Gauss's law for this case. And this is going to be very similar to a problem we've done before, so we can save ourselves a little bit of time. So my plane is going to have a surface charge density
of sigma he will have units of coulombs per meter squared so the problem at, at hand is to find the electric field using gauss's law and we did this problem before by just using straightforward integration but now we're going to do it using gauss's law so i am going to have to construct some type of closed surface that encompasses part of the system. And that closed surface will be a Gaussian kill box. Which I will redraw here. Again, I'll put my units, my unit vectors in, i hat, j hat, k hat. My pill box is a box. It doesn't necessarily have to be a box, but it should be a rectangular parallel pipe head. It has six sides. It'll have a top, S1. It'll have a bottom, S2. It'll have a front, S3. It'll have a back S4. It'll have a left-hand side S5. And it'll have a left, a right-hand side S6. So S1 is the top. S2 is the bottom. S3 is the front. S4 is going to be the back. S5 will be the left-hand side of my Gaussian pillbox, and S6 will be the right-hand side. So you can see immediately a couple of things. S, my closed surface, is going to have six parts to it. S sub 1 plus S sub 2 plus S sub 3 plus S sub four. Let's get these subscripts right. Plus S sub five, plus S sub six. So it looks like I have a tremendous amount of work to do. So if I want to calculate the flux of the electric field through this Gaussian surface, which is in this case is a closed Gaussian pillbox, I'm going to have to do a sum of j from 1 to 6 of the surface integral over six different surfaces for six different electric fields for six different differential surface elements. OK. So that sounds scary. It's not. And the reason why it's not is, let's go back to this table over here. If you look at my Gaussian pillbox, again, I hat is in that direction, J hat is in that direction, K hat is in that direction. I'm going to have unit normal vectors for all of these differential surface elements over the Gaussian pillbox. So what am I talking about? So for my closed S, I'm going to have for S1, I'm going to have a unit normal vector that points in the positive k hat direction. For S sub two, which is in bottom, I'm gonna have a unit normal vector that points in the minus k hat direction. For S sub three, it's gonna point in the positive i hat direction. For S sub four, it's gonna point in the minus i hat direction. S sub five is going to be the um, left-hand side 
So it's going to point in the minus k hat direction. And s sub 6 is going to point in the positive j hat direction. So what am I talking about? So let's do the first surface integral. That's over S sub one. Well, I need to do two things to solve this problem. I need to know what DS is along surface one. Surface one we said was the top of the Gaussian pillbox. And I need to know something about the electric field of my infinite surface. So I know something about DS already. Let me go back to my problem where I had my infinite charged on uh, my plane, infinite plane with a, a surface charge density sigma. And this thing is infinite in all three directions, four directions. So that tells you something important about the electric field. I don't know its magnitude, but I know its direction. And I know the direction of the electric field from any infinite plane of surface charge density, density sigma could not be in this direction. It couldn't be tilted. How do I know that? Well, if I took my infinite plane and twisted it, you wouldn't be able to tell I twisted it. It's infinite. That means that this electric field, if this were actually the direction of electric field, it would have to change, but it can't change, all right? Or it would change, but it, it can't. It's not physical for it to change. The electric field to say that it has this particular direction, if you rotate the infinite field, the infinite uh, sheet of charge, you're not gonna be, tell, be able to tell the difference. So this electric field, couldn't point in this direction, couldn't point in this direction. The only direction that the electric field could point in, so it doesn't change when you rotate the infinite sheet plane, is that it's got to be in the positive k hat direction. So for the first surface integral, E sub 1 is going to be pointed in the positive k hat direction. D sub S1 is also going to be pointed in the positive k hat direction. So the surface integral can be done because the cosine of zero, E dot DS is E to that magnitude of E times the magnitude of DS times the cosine of the angle between them. If E sub one and D sub one, d sub s, one point in the same direction. The angle between them is zero. Cosine of zero is one. Again, the electric field along the top of my Gaussian pillbox is a constant. And the only thing I have to do is find out the area of my Gaussian pillbox. And let's just call that A. So one of the six surface integrals is going to be EA. Now, that's one down, but I've got six more to do. I'm going to do a few of them, but the rest of them I'm going to leave to you to do. That's a homework assignment. That's pretty straightforward. So let's look at the case where I want to evaluate this contribution, S sub 2, where again, S sub 1 was the top. S sub 2 is the bottom. If you go look at our diagram or you look at what we pulled out of the diagram, D sub S, the differential surface element for along surface 2, is going to point in the minus k hat direction. But the electric field is also going to point in the minus k hat direction by symmetry. And using the same steps before as before, namely that the electric field is in the same direction as d sub s2, 
and the fact that the electric field is a constant over S sub two, it is easy to show that you'll get the same result as you saw for S sub one, you'll get EA. So what do we have? For this particular case where we apply Gauss's law for a infinite sheet of charge of surface charge density sigma, I get six surface integrals to evaluate. Trust me, this is much easier than actually doing these integrals formally. And just write three of them out for the moment. I've determined the first one is EA. The second one is EA. The third one is what? Well, S sub three is the front of the Gaussian pillbox. So its direction is going to be plus I hat. But the electric field, again, its direction is never going to change. It's got to be uh, in the direction of a unit normal to the surface. It's got to be in the direction of k hat by symmetry. So this is going to tell you something interesting. When you attempt to evaluate the surface integral, you're going to get zero. I hat and K hat are unit vectors that are orthogonal to each other. The angle between them is 90 degrees. That's going to vanish. And it will turn out, and again, you should go through the exercise of proving this, that the other three surface integrals have that same behavior. Uh, other three. So S sub four, S sub five, as well as S sub six. Please note that it would be a mistake to put a circle here. S sub four is an open surface, it's not closed. And you need to show, we did this to some extent when we did a problem back in vector calculus a few lectures ago. So you need to show that these three surface integrals also vanish. So we're almost finished. Gauss's law has two parts to it, remember? There is the flux of the electric field through some closed surface on the left-hand left side, and that has to equal the charge enclosed by that Gaussian surface over epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space. We chose for our Gaussian surface a Gaussian cylinder. So by definition, a Gaussian surface is closed. And we turn to determine that of the six possible surface integrals that will contribute to the flux of E through the Gaussian cylinder, only two survive. So again, we are in a position where we can sit down and write an expression for the electric field. Two times EA is going to be equal to the charge enclosed, which is just the surface charge density, times the area of the surface of the Gaussian pillbox over epsilon naught. So the magnitude of this electric field is just sigma over two epsilon naught. This electric field is a vector, but I know by symmetry, its direction is normal to the infinite surface of surface charge density sigma. So two points. We did this before, but we did it in a much more laborious way by doing the integral. 
And the second observation is that this electric field is a constant, just depends upon a direction and hat. It depends upon the surface char charge density, which is uniform, which is a constant. So it's so many coulombs per unit area. Epsilon naught is just a permittivity of free space. She's a constant as well as the integer two. Excuse me. So what this means is that um, it doesn't matter how far away you are from this infinite plane, you'll never get rid of the electric field. So normally you think that the electric field should go like one over how far you, you are away from it, squared, one over r squared. And that's true if the system is finite, like an infinite line charge, like we saw before. But for the case of an infinite, uh, an infinite plane that's charged with a uniform charge density sigma, the electric field is a constant everywhere. So you can't escape it. Okay, so the only way to understand Gauss's law is to go through examples. So we will do another example. In this case, we will look at a spherical shell. And we started late today because of technical issues. So we're going to stop. We will go for at least another uh, 20, 25 minutes. So in this case, we're going to look at a spherical shell. Let me draw my axes. Here, let me put in my unit normal vectors, i hat j hat k hat and the shell will have a radius r and it will have a surface charge density sigma so in this problem i want to find the electric field and I want to find the electric field for two cases. One case where I'm a distance greater than the radius of the shell, and another case where I'm at a distance less than the radius of the shell. So put the two together, I'm finding the electric field everywhere. And I'm going to use Gauss's law here. If you don't use Gauss's law, as you'll see in the subsequent problem set, problem set seven, this is a very complicated problem to do. But using Nelson's law is a much simpler task at hand. So what is Gauss's law? It says that the flux of the electric field through some closed surface equals the charge enclosed by the surface divided by the permittivity of free space. So in order to use Gauss's law, I need at least, I need to be able to do a couple of things. I need to choose a Gaussian surface. And I have to be quite judicious with my choice because it has to be a surface such that I can do I can evaluate that integrand. And the second thing I have to do is calculate the enclosed charge, the right-hand side. So, so provided I can do those two things, I can take this side of Gauss's law, which is really complicated, and reduce it to something simple and then equate that to something which is simpler. And at the end of the day, when the smoke is cleared, I'll have an expression for the electric field. So a couple of things about this system. If you look at this, first things first, if I only use Gauss's law, 
I need, I need a Gaussian surface. So what is S? So for this case, I will pick, I don't really have it. I will pick a Gaussian surface that's an imaginary shell. Whoops. Let me get my geometry right. Of radius R, where R is greater than big R. Again, by symmetry, my Gaussian surface has little small differential surface elements, ds, anywhere along the surface of the sphere. The electric field is radial by symmetry. If I rotate the, the shell, you can't tell I rotated the shell. So the electric field couldn't change. So it's only direction, it couldn't have a direction that looked like that. It has to be a direction that doesn't change when you rotate the shell anyway, anywhere in space. And so it's got to be radial. So I'm good to go. The electric field in this case and the differential surface element are both in the same direction. My complicated integral simplifies to just the product of two scalars, E and DS. Again, the electric field is constant by symmetry anywhere over at any point on the Gaussian surface, S. So that means I can pull the electric field out and just do the surface integral. And I know how to do this surface integral. We did this before. It's just four pi r squared, little r squared. So that's the left-hand side of Gauss's law in this problem. So all I need to do now is evaluate the right-hand side. So I'll do that here. So the flux of the electric field over my Gaussian surface is going to be, I'll put everything together, E dS because the electric field and dS are in the same direction. The electric field is a constant over this Gaussian surface. This thing then simplifies to E four pi R squared. And now this has to equal the charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught. Charge enclosed is just going to be uh, the surface charge density integrated over the surface of the real sphere. Please distinguish between the real sphere of the problem and the Gaussian surface, which is an imaginary sphere. That integral I can do. So sigma is a constant comes out. Let's make this look like sigma. And ds is just going to be 4 pi, but let's be careful. It's big R squared. So I'm home free. I have a relationship between the electric field and the charge of the system, the surface charge density. So I can put all this together, namely that the electric field for my spherical uh, surface of surface charge density sigma 
this thing is going to be sigma times r squared over epsilon naught little r squared. Again, I'm evaluating this for a little for distances outside of the shell. And again, I have to turn this in terms, turn the electric field into a vector. That's easy. It's just that. Now this expression may look strange to you, but remember the surface charge density is just charge divided by surface area, where the radius of the physical surface is big R. When you plug those things in, you get something that's familiar. This is little q divided by four pi epsilon naught, r hat, and there is an r squared in the denominator. So this tells you that the problem reduces to that where you concentrate all the charge that's distributed over the surface of the sphere, the real physical sphere, the problem reduces to that of a point charge of charge Q, which is nice. Um, I've left out the second part of the problem, but that's easy to calculate. If you're inside the sphere, there is no enclosed charge. So you can do that surface integral on the left hand side of Gauss's law and invite you to do it. And at the end of the day, you'll just discover that the electric field inside the sphere vanishes. Okay, one last thing. This expression here does look complicated, but it has the right units. You have capital R squared in the numerator, small r squared in the denominator, they both cancel in terms of units, and you're left with a surface charge density that goes like charge over an area. And so I know electric field should always go like one over r squared. Other point to observe is same thing for a point charge system. As you go further and further away from this spherical charge, from this uh, shell, the electric field is going to vanish. Okay. So again, go and check your notes. We've done this problem before. The problem is that it was quite laborious and intensive because we had to do an integration. Here, by using Gauss's law, the good news is we can solve it with much less work. The bad news is that we can only solve it because this problem has high symmetry. So I wanna look at a final example today. And that is an example of a charged solid sphere. So, Here is going to be a sphere. So the previous example, we looked at a shell, a spherical shell that had deposited on it a surface charge density sigma. Here I'm going to have a charged solid sphere of radius big R. I have to distinguish between big R and a little r in my discussions. And this thing will have a volume charge density rho. This is not the same rho that we looked at when we talked about cylindrical polar coordinates. I've mentioned that distinction many times in previous problem sets. So don't, please don't get it twisted. So what do I want to do? I want to find the electric field and I want to find it for two regimes. When you are outside the solid sphere and when you are inside the solid sphere. So let's do case one first. So first things first, I need to find a Gaussian surface. And I need to find a Gaussian surface S 
that has the right symmetry that it will allow me to calculate the flux of the electric field through this closed surface. So if you think about that, the Gaussian surface you want is just going to be a spherical shell of radius r. Why? Because this has a sim the appropriate symmetry for the problem. And more importantly, I know how to deal with this. I did this in the previous example. So I'm good to go. Everything holds. The electric field is going to be perpendicular to ds along that Gaussian shell. So I'm going to be left with an integral, which is much, surface integral is much simpler to evaluate. So it's cosine of zero is one. And again, by symmetry, the electric field is constant over S. So all I have to do is evaluate that surface integral. I've done that before. It's just four pi little r squared where r is the radius, again, we've written it here, but let's put it, emphasize it. It's the radius of the Gaussian shell. It's not big R. So there are two R's in this problem. This guy is in fact that guy, it's the radius. Okay, so Gauss's law has two parts to it. All I've done is calculate the left-hand side. And actually, I just exploited a lot of the work from the previous example. So the flux of the electric field through my closed Gaussian surface, which in this case is a shell, excuse me, is just E times four pi R squared. So now I have to write down an expression for the charge enclosed by this Gaussian surface. And there are a number of ways to do this, but let's just use the results of the previous problem. Even though, uh, well, this entire object, this charged solid sphere, it has a charge associated with it. That charge is just going to be Q. So a volume charge density is just a charge divided by a volume. So the denominator is gonna have four pi capital R cubed and a three in the numerator. And it's gonna be easy to write down an expression for Q enclosed is just rho times my volume of four thirds pi big R cubed. So I have what I want. I have a way of calculating the electric field outside this charged solid sphere in terms of the volume charge density. But note, your answer is gonna be a little bit tricky to write down because there are two types of R. There's the radius of the Gaussian shell and there's the radius of the charged solid sphere. So let's put all this together. So the electric field, so if you're outside the charged solid sphere, the electric field is gonna have, once you do the algebra, it's gonna go like rho 
divided by three epsilon naught, capital R cubed divided by R squared. That's not a typo. Think about that for a moment. R cubed goes like a meters cubed. R squared goes like meters squared. The volume charge density is charge per volume. So that's gonna go like that. And when you put all these things together, you're going to get an electric field that goes like one over a distance squared, which is good. Electric fields are vectors. So you have to put in the vector dependence. And that's done by just putting in a unit radial vector of r hat. Now, we have to finish the problem. Suppose we look at the case where we want to figure out what's going on inside the charged sphere. So the charged sphere has radius r. Well, it stands a reason for that case, you have to pick a Gaussian surface, which will again be a shell, but in this case, little r is less than big R. So calculating the flux of the electric field through ds, the left-hand side of this expression, everything is going to be the same. Okay, you're still going to get 4 pi r squared e. The thing that's going to be different about this case, r less than r, or not, r, little r less than uh, big r, from the previous case where little r is greater than big r, is the enclosed charge. That's going to be different. So let's just take a few minutes and figure out what that must be. In other words, what's the charge that's enclosed by this Gaussian surface or shell of radius r? Where again, I know that my solid sphere has a volume charge density of rho. So everything is easy if you know what you're doing, right? And the same thing here. You can get that answer, but you just have to think about what is it you're doing? Okay, so the charge enclosed, the right-hand side of Gauss's law, is going to be obtained by integrating a volume charge density over a volume. The volume charge density for this problem is just Q divided by 4 pi capital R cubed, and there's a 3 in the denominator and I'm doing a volume integral here. Let's pull out everything that we don't need. 3q in the numerator, 4 pi epsilon naught, r cubed in the denominator. And I now have to integrate the volume of the Gaussian sphere, namely the region of space that's bounded by the Gaussian surface. And that is, four thirds pi r cubed, little r, because that Gaussian surface has, is a sphere of radius little r. So I'm ready to put all this together. I know what the electric field is. The flux of the electric field through my Gaussian surface, that was just e 4 pi little r squared. I know what the charge enclosed. I know what the right-hand side of Gauss's law is. It's q little r cubed divided by r cubed. The 4 pi's disappear. So I can put all this together, recognize the electric field is a vector, and it's q over 4 pi epsilon naught 
r divided by r cubed. And again, it's a vector r hat. And you are inside the uh, your distance is less than big R. Now, you could write this expression in terms of a surface of a volume charge density. And I invite you to do that. And it's just sigma, it's, it's just rho r r hat divided by three epsilon naught. So in summary, let's put all this together. For my charged solid sphere, My last problem I looked at, my charged solid sphere. Again, which has symmetry. That's why we're playing the game of using Gauss's law. We have discovered that the electric field goes like rho r hat r. Um, that's kind of funny to write it that way. Let's write it this way. It makes a little bit more sense divided by three epsilon naught. And this is true if you are inside the solid sphere. If you're outside the solid sphere, the electric field goes like rho capital R cubed divided by three epsilon naught over r squared. So this is for distances greater than r. So a couple of things, let's make sure that, and again, this is a vector, so it needs a, a radial unit vector. Um, do these things make sense? Yes. In the first one, this is a volume charge density. So the numerator goes like one over are uh, the volume charge density goes like one over a length cubed here is meters so again the electric field is going to go like one over r squared same story here that's an r cubed that's a big r cubed that's a little r cubed the denominator so i'm just going to get a distance in the numerator but i have a volume charge density that goes like one over length cubed so the electric field is still going to go like one of R squared. So that's okay. So an amusing thing is that when, well, what happens when little r equals big R? And it's easy to show that these two expressions are equivalent. So in fact, it's perfectly proper to put in less than or equal to there and there. So I want to plot this result, in my final figure. For the case of a charged solid, spherical sphere, charged sphere, the electric field is going to go like R when you are less than big R, and then it's going to drop off like one over R squared, where you are at distances greater than the radius of the charged sphere. Okay. This makes sense because far away, the charged sphere essentially looks like a point charge. This behavior you have to think about for a moment. It's linear, but it's increasing. The reason why it's increasing is as the radius gets bigger and bigger, you're encompassing more of the charge. So the electric field is going to start getting bigger. Okay, 
So in conclusion for problem set seven, which should be available in Google Drive by Tuesday, sometime Tuesday, you will have lots of practice problems using Gauss's law, which again, why even sweat Gauss's law? The reason is that it allows you to calculate electric fields for systems that have high symmetry. So you don't have to go through all those integrals that we've done heretofore. That's the good news. Bad news is that Gauss's law really only applies to a number of systems, uh, infinite wire, infinite sheet of charge, spherical charge distribution, and even an infinite cylinder. And that's it or combinations of those problems using the principle of superposition. But it's still a very nice little tool to use. And in some ways it gives you bigger insight to other problems in electrostatics like Maxwell's equations, which we'll say something about maybe at the very last lecture. Okay, so problems that, f uh, problem six, five, problems that five, the solution key was posted on Google Drive last Tuesday, problem set six was posted last Tuesday. Solution key for problem set six will be available next Tuesday online, appropriate site, Google Drive. Problem set seven will be there. And we went a little longer today simply because we had some technical issues in starting at today's lecture. Okay, so I'm still available now for online questions during the recitation section, which starts now, as well as any questions related to uh, this lecture, other problems, sets, other lectures, and also always available with uh, questions through email. Okay, so thanks very much. Um, time for questions at this stage. See, nothing is just me. I see there are three participants. Should I stop the uh, video? Yeah, let's stop recording. I'll stop.